Um, I'd like to start out just asking you to tell me a little bit about your background before you came to Motown. I know it could take a long time to go through the whole thing, but maybe you give me a brief idea of your, your career up until the 60s, what kinds of things you worked, worked on. Well, uh, I started off uh, my career in Buffalo, New York, where I was raised, as a, a singer that developed into uh, a tap dancer. Uh, I worked with another young man by the name of Bill Porter for some years, and uh, I eventually wound up in, in Hollywood for about three years. Worked, uh, did a lot of extra work in film and worked nightclubs up and down the uh, West Coast. And he eventually went back to, to Buffalo uh, and uh, worked a lot of nightclubs in the Midwest. I was doing the, uh, the 30s. And uh, in 39, I went back to New York and uh, I had a little problem with my uh, former partner, and uh, he went into business with his wife, and uh, so I had to look for another partner. And I wound up in a Broadway show called The Hot Carter, which eventually moved to the World's Fair, starring Bill Robinson, the Bojangles, they called him. and. Uh, I was working with six other boys called, the, or five other boys, it was called the Six Cotton Club Boys. They had been uh, course boys in, uh, in the Cotton Club. And uh, I worked with them for a couple of years, and then I, I started doing uh, some production stuff, and I met my second wife. And we did, uh, some st stuff in Atlantic City with Honey Coles, who eventually wound up being my l last major partner. Uh, and uh, I did an act with uh, my wife, Dottie Salters, who was uh, quite a little singer and dancer out of Philadelphia. And we toured with Cap Galloway uh, until around 43, and I was inducted into the service. Did my hitch in the Army, and I come out. Honey Coles and I were very good friends, and uh, we decided to do an act together to raise some money to open up a dancing school, which never happened, because the act was so successful that uh, we uh, continued to do the act. And that continued until uh, we went into, uh, well, we did a lot of good things. We, we had a European tour, and right after the war, 48, 49, we come back and we auditioned for a Broadway show, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and we made it. And we worked in the Blondes until uh, 52, and then tap dancing started to sort of like fade out, you know, and, wasn't as many good jobs as uh, we were looking for, and uh, we we were just working spasmodically. Uh, we did some things uh, with Tony Martin in Las Vegas, and then we went on tour with the uh, Pearl Bailey unit, and and around uh, about uh, 60, 1960, we decided. Uh, that uh, we would try to do some other things. Uh, Honey had an offer to go into the Apollo as production manager, and I was doing a lot of vocal choreography at that time. I started about 53 in order to make ends meet, you know, in between engagements, I would do some vocal choreography. Let me ask you, a change frame, Johnny, um, about the vocal choreography. What are some of the groups you worked with in those days before Motown? Yeah, well, speaking with the, uh, about the vocal choreography, one of the first groups that uh, I worked with was a group called the Cadillacs, which was uh, 
an exceptionally talented group, and uh, they all moved well, and they sort of established uh, Charlie Atkins' style. Uh, in other words, they basically put me on the map. Everybody would look at them and see uh, their choreographer. They wanted to know who did it, so they would tell him. And uh, then uh, most of the record companies and the group managers started seeking my services, and uh, I started to do quite a bit of choreography for uh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers and the Cleftones and the Heartbeats and uh, the Solitaires and the Moon Glows. Eventually, I did some stuff for Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Tell me more about, about that, about how, when you first saw Smokey and what you uh, helped them with. Well, I had some friends that was in an agency, a Shaw agency, that was booking Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. That's when it was five of them, when Smokey's wife was in the group, Claudette. Uh, they had just had a big hit on uh, uh, Shop Around. So uh, these friends at the agency suggested that they get together with me because they wanted to do a uh, a nightclub act, you know, with some Broadway tunes and stuff of that sort, in addition to their record things. So uh, I had a meeting with them, and uh, we went into uh, a rehearsal period, and we did shop around, and we did some other uh, Broadway things for them while they were in the city uh, in New York working. Well, what would you kind of things would you try to do with a song like Shop Around with a, with a young group like the Miracles? How would you try to help them get a, an identity and a style? Well, the most important thing uh, in, in choreographing for a, a specific tune uh, is to get the storyline and, and try to make your movements uh, rather than just uh, actual movements, uh, let them become more or less a, a physical drama to what they were s singing about, and uh, also uh, honor the, the beat and the rhythmic pattern of the musical track. So it would be a happy marriage between the movement and the vocal, and uh, this is the thing that you give a lot of consideration to. Were they pretty rough when you started working with them in terms of knowing how to move and how to be on the stage, Smokey and the Miracles? No, Smokey was the worst, you know, because most lead singers are, you know. Uh, uh, there's exceptions to the rule. Uh, but uh, the rest of the group moved very well. Smokey did all right, too, you know, but uh, of the five, he was the worst. What, what kind of things would you try to help him do? Charlie, when you started uh, working with Motown, David, lean back. Sorry. Um, was, did, you, did Barry Gordy ask you and, and to help polish the acts with, with, a, with crossover in mind? Was that a real goal of the, of the company? to make the acts palatable across a wide range of audiences? Well, yeah, uh, uh, Barry Gordy uh, brought me out to uh, sort of uh, put a new look on uh, the R&B groups to polish them up for uh, better venues, you know, like the Copacabana and the the hotels in Vegas and Reno and Tahoe and theaters in around. Um, what, what did that mean in terms of choreography to, to polish them up? What kind of things would you change? Well, we're just, uh, uh, the recorded material, we would try to uh, make it a little uh, more palatable for uh, the type of audiences that they wanted to appeal to. In other words, we'd made it a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, 
not as rough and as crude, uh, you know, like regular street dancing. Uh, and primarily to, to, to inject some uh, production stuff into their repertoire, uh, Broadway tunes and uh, things that would uh, make them more of an act and uh, performers rather than just singers of songs. But the song was always to you the, the most important thing. Tell me a little bit about how you build a choreography that didn't get in the way of the singing. You mentioned before how you would give people time to catch their breath and that sort of thing. Well, in, in vocal choreography, you had to give a lot of consideration to the fact that you were working with singers and not dancers. But uh, you had to make the singers look like they were dancers and to make the movements as natural as possible and uh, there had to be a, an association with the movement uh, of somewhat uh, to, to what the lyric was saying. Uh, and you had to give a lot of consideration to the fact that uh, the artists had to come back into the mic area and start singing, especially the background singers, you know. And you had to uh, make sure that they had a couple of bars of music in order to catch their breath. And uh, in many cases, uh, a lot of choreographers didn't give that uh, the proper thought. Mm. And when you work with, with a group, say the Temptations, uh, give me an idea of, of what the rehearsal schedule was like. Was it a really, did it take a long time to work up these routines for these guys who weren't real dancers to begin with? Well, it depends on, uh, it depends on how many peop people are in the group. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, uh, it, it would take almost a week, uh, six day a week of uh, maybe five or six hours a day uh, to do one number. It depended on whether it was a, a ballad, uh, uh, up-tempo. The up-tempo things usually was more energetic, so it would take a little bit more time. But it, 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 within a week, you could uh, stage uh, a, a complete number, a record uh, tune, and also polish it. You only get 65% in the studio anyway. The other 35% you would get uh, during the performance. So you would develop a routine for each new single as it came out? Yes, each, each single that was released on uh, uh, most of the groups at Motown uh, would have to be prepared for television shots, you know, and they would have to be choreographed. Uh, there was a priority given to quite a few of the top draw artists, you know. What about working, working with the Temps? I mean, since we talked to Otis Williams, I want to ask you about him. In particular, was was he a, a quick study, or was he uh, was it hard for him to get it down? Well, uh, some of the attempts uh, were very good uh, with the uh, new choreography. Some of them was inhibited, you know, uh, and you had to work with them, particularly like uh, Eddie Kendricks and Otis Williams in particular. He moved well, had the ability, but uh, inhibitions kept him from thinking that he was able to do it. So we had to work on that and erase uh, that inhibition. And eventually he developed to the point where he felt like he could do it as well as anybody else, which is where he is today. Well, he, he said that you are a real taskmaster and sometimes he just have to leave the room and go out in the back and kick a garbage can and cuss and, <laughs> do you remember that? Well, yes, Otis at times, you know, uh, he would still have a little feeling that uh, he wasn't able to do these things and, and uh, he would call me a taskmaster and said I was driving them like crazy which was necessary because we had deadlines. But uh, 
he eventually would get it as well as anybody else. Do you remember that time when you saw them at the Howard Theater doing the way you do the things you do and gave them some advice afterwards? Can you tell me about that? Yes, I was on a project with uh, uh, Jerry Butler in Washington, D.C., and the Temps was on the bill with him. And they had just released uh, The Way You Do the Things You Do. And they had some things on it, you know. So they asked me if I could give them some advice on it. So in between shows, I would go down in the dressing room and work with them on it. And uh, in addition to the things that Paul Williams had done on it, you know, we retained most of the things. We just straightened out some of the uh, different formations and uh, interchanged some of the movements from one spot to another to make them uh, more professional looking. How was Martha Reeves to work with? Was she a natural dancer or how did that? Martha Reeves was a, a, a very interesting group. I mean, they, uh, the group itself was uh, excellent. Matter of fact, they moved, uh, in my estimation, as well as the Supremes, you know. Uh, and Martha being the lead singer, you know, uh, didn't have to do these things, but when, whenever we, I was rehearsing the background singers, she would get right in there and learn them, although she didn't have to do them. She just wanted to know what they were. So when I wasn't around, she'd be able to correct the girls when they start uh, getting a little uh, ragged, you know. With this, was there a difference when you would work with the Martha and the Vandells and the Supremes? Was there a different identity that you tried to help each, each of those two groups have? Well, the difference in working with the Supremes and uh, the other girl groups like the Martha and the Vandellas and the Marvelettes, uh, you, you let the material dictate to you uh, really uh, how you worked with the group and the degree of talent, you know, and the personalities. All of these things uh, was instrumental in having all of the groups uh, retain their own identity. Uh, and, and the material had a lot to do with it, you know. Well, I mean, what was the identity of the Supremes? What was the, the idea behind their presentation? Well, most of that... The, the Supremes were the first girl group that we started to groom with a, a, a real sophisticated approach. Very feminine looking, you know. Most of the girls uh, wanted to imitate the fellas. See, so it was necessary to pull them back from that and try to make them as feminine looking as possible. And the Supremes uh, had this uh, particular air and the material was soft and, and uh, mostly love songs. And uh, it was easy to uh, inject uh, that, uh, that sophisticated approach. Were the, were the three of them different in terms of how, how they took to your, your teaching and how well, how they learned dancing? Yeah, well, uh, they were all, th there were three distinct personalities, uh, very different, uh, and uh, you didn't want to kill the individualism, but you did want unity and precision, uh, but you still wanted them to do the moves without changing them uh, with their own little personal feelings so that they're 